if I did not acknowledge my biology, I would not be trans. The whole reason you are trans is because of biology. I mean, it's so simple, yet it's being so twisted. Words are being twisted. Ideas about biology are being twisted. All of those things to me feel like gaslighting. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. The following episode is part of the Making Sense of Sex and Gender series on this podcast. In this series, we try to make sense of the distinction between sex and gender, and cover trans issues in a very thoughtful and nuanced fashion. We have balanced discussions from multiple perspectives, including scientists, activists, and a leading feminism scholar. This series will hopefully expand your mind and help you make sense of the current heated debates surrounding the distinctions between sex and gender, as well as transgender issues. The aim is to turn down the temperature on this very heated topic and increase understanding and integrate truth with love. I hope you will listen to this entire series with an open mind and an open heart. And as always, we look forward to hearing your feedback and comments on our website and on the YouTube channel. So without further ado, I bring you this episode within the Making Sense of Sex and Gender series. Hello and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today we welcome Deborah So, Marco Del Giudice, and Buck Angel on the show. First, let's talk about Dr. Deborah So. She's a neuroscientist who specializes in gender, sex, and sexual orientation. She holds a PhD in neuroscience with scientific expertise in paraphilias, hypersexuality, and child sexual abuse prevention. As a journalist, her writing has appeared in several publications like the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and many more. In 2020, she published her book called The End of Gender. Dr. Marco Del Giudice is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. He received his bachelor's in psychology and doctor in cognitive science from the University of Turin in Italy. He has over 100 scientific publications on personality, motivation, attachment styles, psychopathology, sex differences, and other topics. In 2016, he was granted the Early Career Award of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. Buck Angel is an adult film producer, performer, and motivational speaker who also works as an advocate, educator, lecturer, and writer. He has served on the board of directors of the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Alliance from 2010 to 2016. Buck Angel was born a biological female and conquered a lifetime of adversity to undergo his transformation and become the healthy, happy, self-confident man he is today. Buck created the first FTM adult website in 2003 and became the first FTM adult entertainer and film producer. In 2007, Buck made history again as the first transsexual man to ever win the AVN Transsexual Performer of the Year Award, which is essentially the Academy Awards of the adult industry. Recently, Buck has devoted himself to informing and enlightening the world. As he demonstrated in his speaking engagements at Yale University and Idea City 2010, Buck is not only inspiring people to think outside the box, he is redefining gender and educating an entire generation on the fluidity of sexuality and identity politics. In this episode, I talked to Deborah, Marco, and Buck about the scientific realities of biological sex. There is considerable opposition against the idea that sex is a binary, or even that there's any biological component to sex that is meaningful at all. But my panel today argue that denying science because it doesn't seem to fit our gender beliefs or ideology can actually be dangerous. They argue that, as ironic as it seems, when we acknowledge biology, we can accommodate more variation better than our preconceived rigid social norms. I really enjoyed this panel. I hope you listen to it with an open mind and an open heart. And leave comments. If you react strongly in any way, we would truly love to hear from you. This is a really stimulating conversation for me. I really respect these individuals, and I was glad to give them a voice alongside all the other voices in this series. So without further ado, I bring you Deborah, Marco, and Buck. I'm so glad to have you three on this show today, and I want to just start by each of you just introducing yourself a little bit, talk a bit about um, your profession, your career, why you're interested in the kind of topics and things that you talk about, and let's just start with Marco. This is random uh, selection. So I'm uh, Marco Del Giudice. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of New Mexico, uh, starting from next year at the University of Trieste, so I'm going back to Italy. Uh, and I, when I stumbled, actually, I stumbled on sex differences many years ago when I was doing some research on attachment styles. So uh, styles of relationships between kids and their parents or caregivers. And I was analyzing videos and coding these videos, and I, I kept finding sex differences. So some categories of attachment were popping up much more in males 
or in females. And so that's how I started to get interested in the, in the topic, really. And I was reading a lot of evolutionary, I, I was kind of getting into seriously into evolutionary psychology at the time. And so kind of at some point, well, at first I had my videos checked, like the codings. I, I thought I was doing something wrong because you're not supposed to get sex differences in attachment styles. Uh, and then they were still there, you know, after checking, they were still there. And so um, I started kind of thinking about it and reading and kind of clicked in a, in a different interpretation of what I was seeing. And so that was, that was the start of my kind of love affair with, with sex differences. And then I started doing, like, I probably got a bit more notorious, maybe. Uh, I started publishing some papers about how you measure sex differences and the fact that if you consider ones, for example, in things like personality, um, where you have multiple traits, usually what psychologists do when they do sex differences, they do one trait at a time and, and measure the difference between the sexes on each individual traits. And then maybe you average them or kind of take some kind of summary measure. And I introduced uh, a multivariate approach to that. So what happens when you consider more, you know, many traits at the same time and uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the sex difference is going to become larger and more robust. And I'm, I'm still doing quite a bit of that. I have three papers now in the working about uh, trying to do some, let's say, methodological and statistical innovations in how you measure and think about sex differences. And so I got into a lot of interesting conversations since then. Thanks, Marco. And I want to make sure that we talk a little bit today about that work versus the uh, pr predominant view in certain circles that it's all mosaic. So I want to contrast that view with your view. So great. Thank you and welcome. Um, Dr. Doctor, <laughs> Dr. Deborah So, can you tell us a little about yourself? Um, I am a former academic sex researcher. My PhD is in neuroscience and I was specializing in human sexuality. So I used to do brain imaging of sexuality. Um, I decided to leave academia to become a science journalist due to the political climate. Um, I found it for myself just really difficult to pursue interesting questions. Uh, by the end of my PhD, I had written an op-ed criticizing gender transitioning in children because it is not backed by the scientific research. And I knew that by doing so, I would have to leave academia because basically I'd be blacklisted. So I work as a journalist now. My first book, The End of Gender, came out with Simon & Schuster. It debunks nine myths that are commonly held about gender identity in our society, taking a scientific approach. And I write about the science of sexuality, gender identity, academic censorship, criticize racial politics as well. I have a podcast called the Dr. Deborah So podcast. Wow. Welcome. Is that your book uh, behind you? A copy of your book for it people is. who are watching? Yes, there she is. <laughs> Excellent. And then uh, last but certainly not least, we have Buck Angel. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Buck and I am a transsexual man. I transitioned 30 years ago from um, living female to living as male. I am a biological female. I believe in biology. <laughs> the fact that I'm even saying this, is cracking me up, but this is actually a real thing. So I'm not an academic. I am more, I think, I don't even like to use activist anymore, but I'm a person who believes in biology and transition for the right person. Uh, I sit here today because I believe that um, we have gone off the rails when it comes to transitioning. And I'm 100% against transitioning children. And um, that, that's kind of just, I guess, me. And I have a background in um, pornography and uh, sexual wellness products. Um, and so I think I need to put that in there because a lot of people will say, well, he's a porn star. Why do you have him here? So I'm proud of my pornography work. And Though it's not for everybody, I believe pornography can help some people. It helped me and it helped people like me deal with uh, sex and our bodies. So that's me. Well, thank you for your introduction. And per, and to clarify, performing in pornography. A lot of people have a background yes. in pornography. <laughs> yeah, I was a performer. I just watch porn. But, but be, no, I have a background you're, you're in You're underselling performing. yourself. You're underselling <laughs> yourself a little bit here. <laughs> not even pornography studies. That's right, real, right, that's right. right. You could have, you know, that's it, right. It could mean a lot of things. So you actually were a superstar in the pornography world. I guess so. Yeah, I guess I'm an actual porn star. Trailblazer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So really, in my porn work, though, you know, it was really about exposing my body to the world in a way that was on some level helping people deal with those things so gotcha great well thank you for introducing yourself and like i did with deborah when i said uh, behind you is that a copy of your book uh, <laughs> behind you i'm only going to focus on one side of behind <laughs> <you>. <laughs> my sex toys <laughs> no 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 not that side no. <laughs> 
I'm going to focus on the Trampa hat. Oh, right I'm on. on. I'm a Trampa. Um, you, you call yourself Trampa. People call you Trampa. They, you know, you're fans. That might be a really interesting way to kind of start this conversation. You're like an OG of something. And I want to talk about what that something is because um, I was I saw a chart recently about the change in the use of the term from transsexual to transgender. And I saw about, I, I'm visualizing it in my head right now, and I saw about 2011, there was a huge spike in, in a shift, a cultural shift. Up until that point, it was mostly the use of the term transsexual. Um, but something around 2010, 2011, you see this huge um, this shift. And I, I just wanted to get some of your thoughts on what, uh, all three of you, uh, what was the cause in that shift? And, and what do you see as a, a difference between a transsexual and a transgender uh, individual, if, if at all? Yeah, it's a great question because I get the question all the time. And as you all know, I do identify as a transsexual, not transgender. And, and so for me, the reason I keep the word transsexual attached to me is because I believe transsexual is a specific 100%, no variation, no, none of that. It's specifically a person who has been diagnosed from an actual therapist or medical professional with the uh, diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which I have. And it's somebody who wants to live in the binary space. And so for myself, I was born female and I wanted to live in a male space. And so for transsexual people, we really do make an effort to what we call pass as a man and a woman and live in the binary space and just become that and have surgeries and medical intervention to emulate as much as we can that particular sex that we wish we were born as. It's real simple. Where today transgender has become an umbrella term that has excluded the word transsexual and is now open to anybody's interpretation of what they think or feel or have, or you could actually self ID in that space without having any diagnosis. And people believe in that space that you don't need gender dysphoria to be trans. So for me, the transgender label is more of a self-identification label without having a medical uh, attachment to it, where transsexual is specifically a medical position. And I do believe that they tried to remove transsexual so that everyone can self-ID and that it isn't called a, a, a mental disorder, where I do believe I have a mental disorder. Okay. Um, thank you for that uh, perspective. I don't see too many of you around, <laughs> to be honest, that are outspoken and saying, no, like transsexual is what I am, not transgender. And so you're a very, you're in a very unique space. You must feel like uh, in, in some ways you're constantly going up against a cultural current in, in you know, in some ways. And, and the way I see it, and I think this, and tell me what you all think about this, but you know, when you feel such a mismatch between your body and your psychology in terms of your gender, um, one route is to prioritize the psychology, and another route is to prioritize the the the, the biology. You're holding on to the biology when a whole. It seems like the culture today is, and especially with since that trend in 2011, is sending the message to everyone that we should prioritize the psychology over everything else. Um, yeah. What do you What yeah. do you all think of that framing? I think it's important for there to be a balance be between the two and that I think it's important for people to, because you, you see both extremes. You see some people who say it's purely about psychology, it's purely about the mind, it's purely about internal feelings in terms of how someone identifies, and that should be the most important thing. And, and biology is completely irrelevant. And then you see the other side of people saying biology is everything. So the, board, the body you were born with is the body you should have. And you should not even consider transitioning because there's no such thing as living as the opposite sex. And what, however you feel internally is just a feeling and that doesn't mean anything. So for me personally, I, I think both are important. I think there should be a balance between acknowledging that for some people like Buck, transitioning is the way to go and that's going to help them feel better. For the people, especially with the newer wave that we're seeing that you were talking about, Dr. Kaufman, um, in terms of people who are identifying as the opposite sex or a third gender now, very quickly out of the blue, I think this is very much more of a social contagion. It's more about what's happening culturally, and it's about maybe internal distress that they have that they are attributing to their gender when it may or may not actually have anything to do with identity. So I think a good clinician and I'm, I see this as someone who doesn't do clinical work anymore, but I think a good clinician will take both of those into, into consideration when deciding what someone's treatment pathway is and making that pathway very much specific to that person's needs as opposed to taking a sweeping approach. Because what we are seeing now is that people are just saying across the board, however someone feels is what should be taken at face value. 
Right. Yeah. And Marco, I'm going to bring you into this conversation because you taught you taught me something about this topic um, that I, I found very important in my understanding of this and the nuance of it. You taught me that, um, you know, the trans is, is an umbrella for actually m- multiple, uh, sometimes quite different mechanisms or, or sources or, um, you know, um, varieties of trans. It, you, we can't lump it all um, into the same phenomenon. Um, that's something you taught me. So can you maybe uh, bring that perspective in a little bit? So I, I'm kind of a, a bit cautious here because this is really not kind of my my area, okay? So of course, I mean, dealing with sex differences that kind of happen to, and I'm friends with people who actually are in this area as researchers. So I, uh, I try not to stray too much. I appreciate that scientific caution. I think it's kind of obvious if you look at the pathways that people take, kind of that take them to at some point, let's say, I mean, it depends where, what the end point is, right? Because if end point is, let's say, you know, uh, taking hormones or surgery, that's kind of one thing. If the end point is just self-identifying in a way that kind of doesn't match your uh, biological sex or, or whatever, it's also different. It's more, in, there's more, more pathways leading to that. But I think it's pretty obvious that it's not like one thing if you're thinking about you know what what does it mean to be transgender is actually uh, multiple things and people get there for multiple reasons and it's it's a bit different for males and females uh it's different between different kind of decades of course i mean what what you see happening now is you have people who don't match the template of people who were like the typical say you know a transgender uh from from say even 10 or 20 years ago one one accent i can put on this is that uh just by <laughs> Let's say shifting the conversation toward more let's say psychological and subjective uh, right points of view. So from away from this has not been happening just about transsexuals to transgender to but it's been happening in psychology in general from you know sexual differences to gender differences to right. now something you know more and more kind of in a haze of meaning in which meanings are kind of more fluid and, and harder to pin down. And so uh, I think that's. Uh, deliberate in a sense, because if you, you know, um, it helps kind of muddy the waters a little bit and also maintain, if you, let's say, you know, from an activist perspective, right? And not just one activist, but there's a galaxy of activists with also multiple agendas. Mm-hmm. Uh, having words and, and meanings that are kind of shifting and, and kind of hard to pin down is actually, you know, is a resource because you can, so for example, it just, you know, fe- let's feminism, for example, uh, which is not the same thing as, say, transgender. Uh, kind of more activism has had a a complicated relationship with uh, biology, and and even within what I see as you know trans activists, there's there's different perspective on biology, and some and some people kind of embrace at least bits and pieces of it. Some people kind of reject it as oppressive constructs and and stuff. And so um, because at different times or dealing with different topics. People Kind of you know, I'll turn you know, embrace or reject different pieces of, of biology. Let's say it actually uh, is a plus to have meanings that are not fixed and kind of very very uh, um, liquid. Let's say uh, it's actually a plus because you never kind of uh, you can never be pinned down to your definition and into something stable. And so, for example, I. You know, that's the area I know better. Talking about sex differences, I mean, people used to talk about sex differences until pretty much the 60s and 70s, or sexual differences or, or stuff like that. And then gender became a term that was, uh, and that was adopted pretty enthusiastically by, uh, by feminist scholars, right? And the idea there was to introduce this kind of very, you know, a clean separation between what's the domain of the body and biology, where maybe we have this kind of, you know, binary males and females and all this kind of nasty hormones and stuff from the realm of behavior and psychology and, and you know, personality, whatever, cognitive abilities, uh, uh, identity, what people like to do, how they present, so forth, uh, with the idea that that part is essentially mostly a social construction. So you separate the body, which is anchored in biology, from psychology, which is more. And again, you, you have to think this, this was the 70s, right? So in psychology, you had a very strong uh, zeitgeist for social constructionism and situationism. It's like personality doesn't exist. It's all kind of expectations and stereotypes and pressures, pressure from the social situations. So that, that, that was the zeitgeist. And in that zeitgeist, gender is a way to kind of liberate the study of sex from the biology of sex and the body. But of course, 
then you run into other issues because you can't really sustain this dichotomy because a lot of the traits that have to do with, say, personality, education, and behavior turn out not to be really disconnected from the body, as, as people kind of thought. And so it gets really messy. It gets messy. And now if you're, if you're going to talk, I know you're going to talk to uh, Anne Foster Sterling soon, and she's been one of the, the people within the feminist you know, scholarship arguing that we should kind of stop talking about sex and gender as separate and kind of put them together into sex, sex gender. slash gender. Sex gender. Sex, well, she right. has a phrase. She sex has a gender. phrase. It's all one word. It's all one word. Yeah. Right. You know, do I welcome that? And it's kind of because I've, I've been arguing that, you know, people have this illusion that distinguishing between sex and gender actually helps. But the way these terms are defined many times actually confuses things even more. It doesn't really help for, for clarity as much as people think. And so the reason I don't quite welcome this, this further move to, uh, to this sex gender concept is that now you're basically, so here's the, the way it went. You have this binary sex, more or less, uh, and then uh, maybe it's not that binary because you, you bring in intersex conditions and, and all sorts of things we can talk about. Probably we're going to talk about this more later, but uh, basically, it's not, you know, something at least rooted in biology. And then you have gender, which is kind of disconnected from biology and is free floating, kind of you know, lots of social construction and stereotypes and, and and roles. And and then now by reconnecting them, I see that as in part as a move to take what's left of biological sex and make it conceptually as fluid and Correct. and and airy and kind of you know uh undefined as gender has become so i don't see that a move to ground gender into something a bit more biologically realistic but a move to take what's left of sex and and just dissolve it forever into this kind of you know multi-dimensional non-binary one point i really want to make um well, that you made what that i want to zoom in on is there there's something quite profound here that if we if we step back a second and and uh, look at it from a, a larger picture i do notice that a lot of feminist scholars um for good or bad this is an observation i i see is an observation is that um there tends to be various beliefs that are correlated within them one being um that that sex is the gender is very very fluid in in sort of uh, um, extremely uh, non binary way, um, but also they often talk a lot about um, nature versus nurture debate and try to downplay the role of genes in anything as well. You very rarely see like a a, f a feminist scholar who's like a behavioral geneticist but also believes gender is fluid. I'm just trying to think of like what would be the sort of the juxtaposition that'd be odd to find among a feminist scholar. But you see what I'm saying? There tends to be an overarching disdain for the idea that we can have unchangeable uh biology at all. And and I, I'm curious, first of all, why? Like why is the G word so scary, genes, when, you know, as Steven Pinker has often made the point, which I really like, would we want to live in a world where we were hundred percent determined by our environment? That would sound that sounds horrible. <laughs> like isn't there something good to be unchanging within you? I would say there is something good, right? Maybe I should just pause there and say, well, can you all kind of defend for me the value of biology? Um, it seems almost silly to say, can you defend the value of biology? But but Dr. Deborah So, every time that she posts, and I see you, Dr. Deborah So, but every time you post on Twitter, sex is binary, unchanging, and immutable. You, I mean, that's a shitstorm that, that is created every time you say, and you know a shitstorm is going to happen. So I also want to know, like, how do you deal with that psychologically? Like, you know, it's coming. It's not like you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so shocked that that caused a shitstorm. But yet, but yet you still feel a reason to defend that view. So could you, maybe let's start with you. Can you just talk about when, every time you kind of talk about that idea, why, why do you believe uh, that it's important to say that? Yeah, first of all, I want to say I love Steve Pinker. Secondly, why I think it's important to talk about biology is that it's reality. And I don't think we should be afraid of talking about the truth, even if it upsets people or if it is politically inconvenient. And to your point about why feminist scholars tend not to want to defend biology or acknowledge it and tend to be more focused on social constructionist ideas or the value of society and culture and sexism or whatever else. I think because for many of them, or if not most of them, their training is in a discipline that has no basis in science. And for some of these individuals, I'm sure they go through their entire academic training 
without ever taking a class in biology or evolutionary psychology. So they don't know anything about these disciplines. All they hear about them is that they are sexist and that they're misogynistic and that there's no value to them. So I think that combined, that ignorance, whether it's willful or, willful or otherwise, leads them to feel morally just in the way that they present biological research and also in their ignorance. And I would say for scholars who are aware of the scientific research, like I've said this all the time, if you actually read studies about prenatal testosterone and the effects on the fetus in the womb in terms of the masculinization or otherwise, or lack of masculinization, you cannot claim that prenatal testosterone is a myth or that it doesn't exist, or that there are no sex differences in the brain. I don't think acknowledging sex differences or biologically based sex differences justifies sexism. I say all the time, just because men and women are on average different, that doesn't say anything about individual people, does not justify sexism against women. And if anything, I think it's sexist to say women have to be the same as men in order for us to be worthy of equal treatment. That's why I speak out about it. I think I, I think it's such a shame that in academia, I mean, I'd be curious to hear more about Dr. Delgadici's experience because I've left academia. I imagine it's probably very difficult to do this type of work if you do want to speak to any sex differences at all. And then because people think immediately you're suspect if you're interested, like, why would you want to study that? You must be a sexist person. And then if you actually show that these sex differences exist, they have to be socially constructed. If they're not, then you are a sexist. So yeah, and I'm just honestly used to the criticism at this point because when people get upset about something, it's always internalized misogyny or you are, what else is there? I mean, transphobic is like- Turf, <laughs> you're a turf. Basically, I get called transphobic <laughs> turf. But I, you know, they can't actually come back with any relevant criticism because I'm totally open to that, totally open to that. But it's it's always about, you know, you hate women, you're X, Y, Z. And if anything, I think it's actually more harmful to women and patronizing to say that we are not in control of our own decisions and that the only reason we make the decisions we do, say with the, the sex ratio in STEM disciplines, science, math, and technology, um, engineering, that that's due to sexism and women being being criticized unfairly by men and not wanting to be in these situations that make them uncomfortable. I'm thinking, doesn't that make women sound like we are, you know, weak and pathetic instead of saying, you know what, yeah, sometimes you experience sexism, not always, but you, if you're really interested and you're passionate, like I have a PhD in neuroscience. And I, I, I just think it's when I listen to these scholars speak, they treat women like, and they're terrifying girls into not going into these disciplines also, but they treat women like we're so weak and that we're not capable of making our own decisions and that we're completely dependent on men's approval or men's um, support in order for us to be successful. Mm. I see Buck nodding there. I just I, love I, her. I just love Deborah. <laughs> She's such a badass. Oh, I love <laughs> no, you too. No, because you're so Aww. straight on. It's just so beautiful to hear the common sense that comes out of your mouth. And that's why she gets shut down. You know, Buck, I saw a tweet that you wrote, which just dovetails uh, very much with what Dr. Soder said. You wrote, it is transphobic to deny biology. I thought that was a fascinating tweet. Could you unpack that for yeah. us a little bit? Because you don't often, that's not something, a sentence you often hear, right? Well, not. And <laughs> Dr. Deborah just <laughs> stated, you have to be really solid in your beliefs and not be sort of scared of the gaslighting and the pile on because you believe in reality. And so for me, it's really about my space, right? It's, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not here to speak for the transgender community. I never have and I never will. I'm here to speak for what this did for me as a person and how it really was so instrumental in me being sitting here today and why I became a success in so many avenues of my life was 100% transitioning to live as a male. Now, that being said, if I did not acknowledge my biology, I would not be trans. The whole reason you are trans is because of biology. I mean, it's so simple, yet it's being so twisted. Words are being twisted. Ideas about biology are being twisted. All of those things to me feel like gaslighting. Like, that's not real. What are you talking about? And even to me, when Deborah Dr. Deborah speaks, it feels like she's being gaslit constantly about her own way of, you know, of, of actual real, real scientific uh, facts. So when I talk about biology, I talk about it because it's, it's important to me, number one, because of health reasons. So if, if my biology was not attached to me, Right. And I can tell you this from many examples. I can show you many examples of why my biology was so important because, you know, I am being a biological female. I have a, you know, female body. I have, you know, reproductive system, which is what a female has. And by injecting testosterone into the female body, it disrupted so many 
health problems down in that space of the reproductive system that if I didn't talk about it or the doctor didn't know about it, how are they going to say they saved my life because they knew that I was a biological female. And this is one of the biggest arguments I have for this nonsense that's coming out of the transgender sort of, I call it an ideology, because trans is not an identity choice. Trans is a medical condition. And that's where I run, you know, butt heads with the community because I believe this is a mental disorder and it does have everything to do with biology. And if we deny our biology, not only are we denying our transness, but we're also denying our own health and how we move forward in the world when we're injecting cross-sex hormones that don't belong. This testosterone does not belong naturally in my body because if it did, why am I injecting it? So, you know, that, that's why I say things like that. It pushes against this new narrative that says, you don't, you know, biology doesn't matter. It's a social construct. You know, gender is this. All of these things that li- that actually go completely against everything I am and have been and why I transitioned. Well, thanks for presenting your perspective. Both you, Buck, and and you, Doctor So, have both said things that uh, there probably there are some listeners their head has, has exploded. Uh, you know, saying uh, <laughs> the combination of both of you saying trans is a mental disorder and it's a social contagion, which Doctor yep. So said would be enough for someone to completely uh, explode. So let me play devil's advocate then, because I know there's someone. You know, I I think it's good to steal man things, right? Um, so let me say that as a psychologist who, who recognizes biology, I would argue that our psychology is the result of our biology too. It's like, I I think it's silly how we have separated our body from our minds in terms of one is biology and one is complete social construction. I mean, I'm a big advocate of the neurodiversity movement and no one would say like autism spectrum way of thinking is completely a social construction, right? It's associated with very, as Dr. Del Gucci has spent his career studying various biological markers um, interacting with society. So couldn't one make the case that um, there is something real, uh, a transgender, a real trans sort of psychology where your psychology feels so at odds with your um, with your physical characteristics, I'm, I'm not distinguishing biology from psychology. I'm saying it's all psych- biology. It's all biology to a certain degree, um, but but distinguishing the mismatch between your psychology and your biology that is real, and that we should, um, you know, a compassionate, uh, just society is one that recognizes that and helps people. And maybe even normalizes in a way that this is maybe where Trampa really disagrees because I'm not there yet where I say um, every instance of that mismatch with psychology is a mental disorder. I'm not there yet. I'm not making I personally wouldn't make that argument. I think we have to kind of look at it a case by case basis in a lot of ways. Um, so um, just playing devil's advocate, would you when you say there's a there's a space for helping people with um, that mismatch, um, helping them uh, change their psychology in ways that make them feel most self-actualized, like they're living their best life. Like what's wrong with that? Nothing is wrong with that. What I sort of advocate for is maybe there's something else going on there. Maybe it's not transness. Maybe it's a different kind of thing that's happening. Maybe a body dis, you know, dysphoria. Maybe, maybe things are happening. We are not addressing other mental health issues. We are just saying, oh, well, you just feel trans, you're trans. That is not fair. That is not fair not only to trans people, but to that person. Because we've taken mental health out of the equation. And when you take mental health and you just say anyone who says they're trans, you now have what we have today, which pardon my language, a shit show. And we have a huge amount, whether or not anyone out there tries to push against me on this. This is a fact. We have a large amount of detransitioners. And that's happening because these trend detransitioners were not addressed in their mental health. And they'll even tell you that. So yeah, mental health is definitely a part of what's happening here. But mental health is a huge spectrum. It's not just X, Y, and Z. And just because you're autistic does not make you trans. Now that's a narrative. You're autistic, you're trans. I think that's unfair to autistic people as well. So that's why I think like really understanding diagnosis and understanding mental health care and how important it is seeing what's going on with this kid, what's happening here, social contagion. I believe in social contagion. I see it happening every day. It's easy to lure a a kid into something. We all want to belong to something. The goal of treatment should be about helping someone feel better, not to simply just give them treatment for the sake of it or because it's going to get you social accolades. And like Buck is saying, there's so many detransitioners who – there, I I don't doubt that they were struggling legitimately with 
something that was very distressing, emotionally difficult. The way that I talk about this, and I was so worried for a long time that the things I was saying about this newer wave of young people who are transitioning very quickly, that I was wrong. And when I listened to their stories, I would say, especially for those born female, almost every single one of them seemed to have a history of sexual trauma that has not been addressed. And so when you mask over that with these other solutions, at the end of the day, that trauma is still going to be there. And that solution is not going to actually help them feel better. So when they do come out on the other side, living as a man or a third gender or, or however they identify, they are not, and I, third gender, I say in quotations, I don't believe there's such a thing as a third gender, but they're going to still be dealing with that trauma. And so I, I think it really is doing a disservice. It has to be Something that, you know, for someone like, Buck, as I mentioned, obviously he's thriving, he's much happier and it's helped him. But I think that is part of, and maybe Buck, you can talk to this because I know we've talked about this before. It's had to do with a, an appropriate and effective assessment process and time and asking questions and ruling things out as opposed to simply saying, whatever you want, we're going to give it to you. This is what I'm hearing. I'm going to reflect the mirror back. You Let me know if the summary statement I just wrote down, it really agrees with both of your views. It seems like you're saying trans activism has prevented us from helping people who need help, perhaps in a different way than the activists say they need help. 100%. I will say that. that yeah. why, when, I, yeah. when I joined this this today, I said I'm not an activist because I believe that even that right. word has been hijacked on some level. Activism helps create positive change on some level. And, you know, what they're doing to me is hijacking a whole movement in order for themselves. The trans community has become me, me, me. If you listen to it, like just take pieces out of it, you'll see it's me, me, me. That's not where I come from. Community is about us and about all of us. And it's a very diverse community. We aren't all the same. We don't transition a lot for the same reason. But that being said, mental health care has been actually removed from transition. You have affirmation therapy. That is not therapy. That is just saying, okay, kiddo, you said you're trans, right on. Here you go. How is that therapy? That's just telling a kid they're right. And that's dangerous. And we're seeing the dangers of that really coming back on us now. And my community is actually really upsetting because they're not speaking up about it. They all know. Don't think that people don't know in this community. They know damn right. I'm one of the only besides like Blair White and a couple of other of us. We're like the only ones who are like, hey, wait a minute here. And that gets us into a lot of trouble. And that scares me. The fact that people in my own community cannot stand up against what we see because they all see it. And here we sit today arguing if biology is real. Or, I, I, I just am in shock about it and upset by it. Love Blair White and also want to say, I think, and I'm not transgender, so I never want to seem like I'm speaking for the community, but I really worry about what the activism is doing to the community because I think most average lay people who are not paying attention, they see some of the crazy things that activists are asking for and they actually think that represents transgender right. people. And I, I understand why people in the community probably wouldn't want to stick their neck out because I see the way that someone like Buck is treated. Buck gets called transphobic all the time, which is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> but I do wonder, uh, uh, now that we have more detransitioners coming out, now we see what's happening in, say, women's sports, it's really putting people off of wanting to advocate for trans rights, which I think we should care about. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, uh, thank you to both of you for speaking your, your truth there. And um, let, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, Buck, do you... Uh, if, if if you were forced, uh, you know, give a give a bone to the transgender activists, like give them something that they're doing right, you know, so it's not all negative. Um, okay. Do you think that there are legitimate? I guess this is my direct question for you. Do you acknowledge there are legitimate cases within the transgender community that are not uh, reduced to mental illness or narcissism, but um, where changing pronouns and the various other psychological and maybe even physical alterations are very helpful to those individuals? Well, I'm going to say, um, yeah, I, I would say so, but I would say that that's not like me. And that's why we need to distinguish there's differences within the trans and why I call myself a transsexual. Today, trans is a mm -hmm. self id space in any way. And if that helps you, and it makes you feel like you're solid in your space and you're an adult making that choice. I have nothing to say about that at all because that's an adult making the choice. But the problem for me is that now we're pushing it this sort of space onto young people who aren't in a position to make those life-changing choices. And so I, I always distinguish the difference between adults doing this and the activism around that, which is, I would consider that like sort of more non-binary because that's now under the trans label. And a lot more people are taking mm -hmm. on non-binary than trans at this point. 
point. Yet they're equating both of them as the same. And but that's all again. Mm. If it makes you feel better, if you're moving through the world better, and you, I, I really feel like it's part of this sort of. Um, you know, it's a community. Everyone wants to be part of a community. So it feels like these people are creating this sort of a community that is not what I am. And that's why I keep reiterating. It is so important to understand the difference between somebody who acknowledges this as a mental disorder, which I do, and people who don't acknowledge it as a mental disorder. But consider if you think you're trans, you're trans. You have to see. Everyone needs to see the difference. of That's what the activism today is 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 about. It's about self-IDing. It's about creating a non binary space it's like trying to get rid of biology and that doesn't work for me this is so fascinating you have two sides here one side and both sides are making are, are arguing the same thing in a way they both think their existence is being wiped out and so how do you as me mr un peacekeeper over here <laughs> i hey by the way i tried so hard i don't know if anyone saw my tweet where i said hey anyone i would love to have a respectful conversation between a transgender individual and a turf like uh, who would speak to each other and no one wanted to speak to each other and every single person from either side they all said why would i talk to someone who denies my existence but they're all that's what they're both saying. <laughs> I couldn't find anyone from the transgender community who felt comfortable uh, to be part of this, which is why I made it a four part series, just so everyone's voice could be heard separately. <laughs> but I would ideally like to live in a world where we can all, I guess, stop the victimhood mentality for one second. <laughs> Can I speak to that, my friend? Yeah, I put myself in positions to speak to the opponents. You know that I get, I, I am, I, I get asked to be on all kinds of places where I don't necessarily align with the way they think. They hate me. I go on a lot of shows where people actually hate me. They don't think I'm existence. They don't. But I have to do that because I feel like I'm being wiped out from the trans community. And so, because people hate us more, I'm, I transitioned 30 years ago. I have never felt more hated <laughs> in my 30 years of transition than I do. Mm. That should say something to. Everybody out there, not only from my own community, but from the world. So that being said, the fact that says everything that you put that out there, can someone step up to the plate and have the conversation? If they believed in what they were saying, they would step up to the plate. I believe in what I'm saying. I live it every day. I will step up to the plate to show you people like me exist. We are real. We need this. I will die if I don't have it. And that's where I am butting heads with this community because they don't see this as a, for me, for a person like me, they only see it about them. And that is why I have this sort of schism with them and this thing, because they're not willing to step up and have the conversation where I am. I, I was going to say, it's also because I think they are complete. They have the uh, approval of society right now. So why would they engage with someone like me? Because they only have something to lose. Maybe they, on some level, know that they're perspective is not going to hold against my argument. But I think also because if they accept the invitation, they only have something to potentially lose by being associated with me or being willing to engage with me. Do you see a world like I'm trying to think what a utopia would look like? Do you see a world where no one feels like their existence is being eradicated by another group? Like, can we can, can we have transsexuals and transgenders both coexist as yeah. real? Like where we, we acknowledge yeah. you're real, you're like Oprah, <laughs> you're, you're real, you're real, you're real, you're real, <laughs> you're all real. Like what if I got an Oprah mindset about this? Like can we live in it? Is that even possible? It just feels like every time I try to unite or every time I try to have people listen to each other's perspectives, I'm the enemy. <laughs> and I'm like, w w why? <laughs> why? Why do we have to live in that world? You can't be in the middle. Yeah, you can't be like, in the middle. You can't. These days, these days, it seems like you can't. That's a good point. I think my prediction is that, of course, there will always be, and I don't even like to use the word transsexual. Like I respect Buck's decision because obviously that's how you identify and that's your life. But for people who've medically transitioned, I think there will always be people who medically transition. I think this newer trend, this trendiness of the mm. non-binary, the third gender, yeah. the gender fluid, et cetera, I think that is right now a thing that has to do with youth, that has to do with trying to get cloud and attention and fit in and once that movement eventually dies out people are going to move on to the next thing i think that will be hopefully within the next decade gone and we've forgotten about it well hopefully not forgotten about it because i think there will be children who will be dealing with the effects of making potentially the wrong decision for themselves which i think is devastating but for the people who are jumping onto this as a way to promote their brand or to get ahead in their career or put their pronouns everywhere because that's the socially acceptable thing to do, it's gonna, we're going to move, move on to something else culturally.
And I, I, I'm just really worried about what the after effects are going to be, because to me, this is not just about trendiness. This, these are people's lives who are being affected. Okay, can I try to bring it to uh, the context a little bit? Because, uh, and in a way, I'm going back to your question, Scott, about you know offering a defense of why why do you want to you know take biology seriously? Mm-hmm. And here's one thing that I kept thinking while listening to Deb and Buck is you know there's of course again there's a uh, parts of what is right now the say transgender movement that have very different motivations and very different you know social correlates Mm -hmm. part of that might actually die down if the interest kind of dies down and but there's also i think something that uh comes through is we have lost nuance in our thinking about sex and males and females so you actually end up with a you know after whatever, 50 years of, of kind of trying to detach our understanding of psychology from the understanding of, of biology, you really end up with, not with a model of males, you know, men and women that is more rich and more kind of, you know, nuanced. And, but it seems to me you end up with something that's a bit more impoverished and very rigid. And so we, you, you end up with this thing where every kind of, you know, we can't think about variation anymore. It's like you, you have to be, you know, you have these very rigid categories. And if you don't think you fit all the, you know, check all the boxes, you, you must be kind of out of the categories. You're not, you know, neither males or females. There's all, and this whole thing about, you know, non binary, gender queer, whatever. Uh, I think it betrays at a cultural level and even an academic level, because there's a strong contribution from academia, is the kind of loss of ability to think seriously and in really nuanced ways about variation within the sexes and my one of my defenses of biology is that there's a misunderstanding which is because you know the biological understanding of sex starts from something that is functionally binary right you know two roles in reproduction two kinds of gametes so you have this kind of very strong kind of conceptual binary at the at the root of that uh the misconception is that this idea of a strong binary, you know, uh, gets carried out to all the levels, including behavior and psychology and development and so forth. But actually, you know, if you if you really understand the biology of sex, there's also pressures in there that favor variation and divergence and and you know <laughs> and differentiation within males and within females. You know, you, we're probably not going to talk about sexual selection, but sexual selection is a powerful mechanism in biological evolution, and one of the things it does many times is to produce divergence between the average, say, traits in, in males and females. But one of the other things it does, it can actually create uh, variation within a sex for a bunch of different reasons. And so this idea that, you know, thinking biologically about sex puts everything in two very rigid box where there's no variation, and all the variation and interest and differences come from the culture, say, culture or learning or, or whatever. I think that's a fundamental misconception. If you, you know, that's one of my... I think most powerful defenses of biology, actually, taking biology seriously and not as a, the cartoon version of it helps you not just thinking about sex in the, in, the, in a more kind of categorical terms, but actually helps you deal with variation in a way that's more nuanced, more interesting, and I think more also more personally, uh, you know, meaningful for a lot of people than a purely social constructionist perspective on that. There was some mentions of autism here and there, right? And yes. uh, I, again, I that's one of the topics I've published a little bit on. I've, I've been trying to take an evolutionary perspective to uh, autistic traits, so the autism mm-hmm. spectrum. And again, I, I don't know if I have the right explanation, right? But uh, I have one, one model of that. And the model is basically that what you have is... Um, if you if you look at the entire phenotype, not just the cognitive traits that everyone focuses on, but also what let's call the motivational background. So uh, the say sexuality of people in the, on, the, on the spectrum, or their uh, how they behave and how they uh, they they you know they function in say romantic relationships or friendships or uh, competitive interactions and so, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you try to explain this kind of together. Uh, I think. Um, so my hypothesis is that this could be a kind of mild, male biased uh, strategy in a, in a biological sense that actually fits into the, fi- the fact in our species we have a lot of parental investment also from fathers. So you have male provisioning instead of just female provisioning. And we have a variety of ways in which we can do that. And the idea is that there be, there's been in our species selection for kind of you know, long-term relationships 
So people who kind of fit well into long-term relationships and uh, end up providing and, and investing in their kids, but doing so uh, indirectly by basically doing other stuff and providing, you know, because of the things they do outside. So developing, say, te- let's let's call them technical cultural skills and and whatever, which is what the you know kind of the autistic mind kind of excels at, like systemizing and learning about stuff and and becoming technically proficient in in something. So that's you know there's a very short cartoon of it, but the idea is from this hypothesis you predict that people on this on the spectrum and again it's not there's also it changes when you're talking about autism that's more severe because I think it's really not the same thing as the milder forms. It's just not and there's evidence for that. But if you talk about the, let's say, the mild version from, from uh, let's say, normal variation in autistic traits to people with kind of mild diagnosis, uh, what you expect to see is a bit of a, of a mosaic of traits. So what you expect to see from this perspective is uh, a profile that's from the cognitive point of view is as Baron Cohen would say, like an extreme male brain. So there's a shift toward a more male typical version of things like, you know, visual abilities and some some cognitive skills and so on. But from a motivational perspective, when you're thinking about, you know, peer bonding and and sexuality and so forth, what you see is actually a shift in the other direction. And and that, again, uh, from the the standpoint of this hypothesis is um, is no accident. You actually have a potentially selection for combinations of trait that don't all go in the same direction of being more female typical or male typical. And that could arise as a result of biological processes. That's an example, I would say, of, of how biology helps to think about things in a way that's not the, how a lot of people, you know, think. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and this is what is confusing me right now, because I've gone my whole life just taking for granted that I'm a man. Like I, for me, as I said to a trans individual who was on my show, I said, can you tell me what it's like to be trans? Because I don't know. Like, I've always just, I'm like, I'm a man. Like, I don't think about it, right? Like, um, but here's the thing. Like, I'm now getting all confused because if it's technically true that, I, I mean, we can say our, our not just our psychology is a mosaic, but our physical is a mosaic too. I mean, I got like so many dude physical characteristics, right? Like I got chest hair popping out of my shirt right now, but I'm sure if you I, you looked at my eyebrow, you'd be like, oh, the eyebrow was statistically more like the average <laughs> female than the, I bet if you started like picking apart all the pieces of me, you would say yeah. that's female on average, that's male on average. And same thing with um, my psychology. Like there are various aspects of my psychology that are so stereotypically dude, right? Like I, I, I have agents, uh, you know, let's go, let's do it. But I also have compassion, which is sometimes stereotypically female. So it confuses me because given that we're all kind of this mosaics in both, like, what is, like, how do I know anymore what I am? <laughs> I guess that's what I'm That's saying. Right. Like, how do you know I'm a man now? Because I'm getting all confused. <laughs> Where I think these arguments kind of you, you should not take it is to the extreme of saying, oh, we're all just kind of random mosaics of this. Because no, that's, okay. that's not the way I think to try to kind of dissolve the, the fact I started that, existentially having right. an existential quandary there, a crisis. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, but this, it's so fascinating. And this is where I, for me at least, the conversation really gets kind of uh, you know, exciting. What I think is, is the... Um, is the benefit potentially of, of an evolutionary perspective on this is that you can think about function. And, and again, at least I have some hunches about how some traits or combination of traits may actually be uh, advantages or, or arise as byproduct maybe of other things, but at least you know find a functional grounding for that. And if you do that, um, I think you, you will find that some, let's say constellations, for example, of personality uh, are better understood as as mosaics in a sense from a from a masculinity femininity perspective. So you actually have some, uh, and in other cases not so much. And at the same time, statistically, and not just statistically but also functionally, you see that for most people the traits tend to go together in a certain way. So uh, you don't want to, you know, I think there's there's a balance again to be found between acknowledging the what are the big statistical trends. But not just looking at them only as statistical trends, also trying to understand what's the functional base. So there, there's there's meaning there. There's it's not random. There's a reason why some traits tend to go together with others. And and also there might be sometimes biological reasons why for subsets of people it makes sense biologically to to not follow the big trend, let's say, but to end up in some less uh, crowded corners, let's say, of the of this space of masculine and feminine uh, phenotypes. I would just not not want to apply this mosaic concept in a blanket way, uh, as some people do, uh, 
as a way to argue that, well, because we're all mosaic, you know, what does it mean to be typically male or female? Yeah, because we're all mosaics, that's why sex doesn't exist. Yeah, I've heard that argument. So thank you for helping me with that existential (laughs) crisis I was having there. Okay, There's an easy resolution there because, you know, if biology actually worked as, as some people think it does, like, you know, or should, like pushing just the sexes, all males in one to one side, all females to the other side, uh, that would be um, some kind of a paradox. But yeah. that's not how biology works. It can create you know, variability and alternative strategies and you know different ways of being males and females that are not just kind of socially meaningful, but m- may have a, a biological grounding too. And when you get to that point, you, you really have to parse things carefully and you, you can't just have a, you know, a simple catch-all you know, solution of all your of your questions. If that's the case, then it, this is the million dollar question. Is there room for psychology to be part of that? That's really the million dollar question. Because when I ask um, the uh, chat AI, um, what is a woman? Because uh, I was curious what the artificial intelligence machine would answer it. They Their answer was that it's either uh, biology, an adult, uh, an adult uh, woman based on their physical characteristics or it's their gender identity. They're leaving a more expansive definition that it's like you could it, it could be anything, right? That's my million dollar question. There is like yes, if we are expanding our notion of what it means, um, do we do we allow for gender identity to 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 be one valid answer? That's really the question on the table here, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Speaking to that, I am very concerned about how this definition, the definition of woman, is being changed because we're seeing more and more. Mm. It's not adult human female. It's not based on gametes. It's based on identity. And if you can change the definition of woman, what else can you change the that's definition right. of? I think this is only the start of something else that's going to continue going on and, and is potentially very destructive to society. Give me um, a, a fear that you have. Uh, give me something that you think would be ridiculous. Like just even, you, probably, you probably already think this is ridiculous. Something you think even more ridiculous if, if we went down that, that road. Yeah. I think it speaks to this larger theme of science denial in that if we can change the definitions of things based on people petitioning for it, then why do we have to pay attention to evidence or data? Why can't we just make things up based on how we feel or what we think a good social outcome would be? And so with, say, I I think sex, the denial of sex differences, the denial of biology with regard to gender dysphoria, these are, I mean, we're seeing this happen in real time, and and I don't think this is going to be the end of it. And also to piggyback on that, I wonder why it's only about women. Why are we not t- changing the definition of man? Why is it's everything? It's a wonderful question. Yeah, I, I, I no say one it all. Ever the... asks, what is a man? I do. I say yeah, it all the time. Man? I put it out there. I'm like, why are we only sort of on some level pushing against the women's space and what it means to be a You're woman? Right. And any and so on on, right. on on the other side of that, I I also think it's dangerous. And I can give you examples. Like when you self-ID as a woman and you're a man, and let's use the example of prison. And here in California, any man can identify as a woman now, which means that that we have to respect that. And now that man who identifies as a woman, and that's why biology matters to me, now is being put in a woman's prison and things are happening because biology happens. And this woman who is a biological man is doing things in these prisons that are absurd and ridiculous. And these are why, this is again why biology matters. This man who's identifying as a woman is going into a space where a biological woman is, they think differently, they act differently, they are different. And rapes are happening, bad things are happening. So, you know, for me, I I don't, I'm not academic, so I'm not speaking in those terms or that way. I'm speaking in a more sort of my own observation as a transsexual Your personal and experience real, as well yeah. yeah right real life experiences and i don't care if a man wants to identify as a woman go right ahead but respect women when you do that and they're not they're not i'm gonna just say it here they're not they're 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 doing this that's why they're trying to dismantle what a woman is because when you dismantle what a woman is anyone can be a woman and and that's just not true and why we need to distinguish the difference between a trans woman and a woman and i say it all the time it's like they're not the same they'll never be the same and what and so also i want to talk about this idea of children know who they are what happened to gender non-conforming what happened to getting better of gender stereotypes now if a little kid says 
they're a boy, we're immediately medicalizing them, putting them on all these drugs and having surgeries. And anyone who goes against me on this, I will I will debate you to the end. They are giving children surgeries and they are doing um, hormone blockers and cross-sex hormones on 16-year-old kids are kids. 15, I know a 13-year-old who actually had top surgery. So, so these are the things that are really disturbing to me because we are pushing young people into this, again, binary space when all I hear on this message from this community is non-binary, binary isn't real. Yet, why are you doing that to children then? Why are you immediately shoving them into a binary space because they said they're a boy or a girl? So what was told to me in another interview I did, which is part of this series uh, from a trans non-binary individual, um, they said that it's, there's nothing automatic about it when a kid says they want surgery, that there's a, that's, it's very, very, they take it very seriously. Not true. There's a very, uh, a whole team of people. I'm saying, I want their <laughs> voice to just be heard for one second uh, because they, because I, I, I can't bring you all together. I'm trying to break, like think of uh, people's yeah. voices to bring in. <laughs> I'm trying here, yeah. folks. I'm trying. Yeah, I, I apologize. I just get very upset about the lies. They're actual lies. I interview detransitioners. Right. And I, I, oh, I don't think anyone's denying that they don't exist, but but that it's 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 not automatic surely it's not like a 12 year old walks into the doctor's station and says please remove my breasts and they immediately do it right oh uh, well i'm going to tell you from my own experience dealing with detransitioners many of these people had literally less than an hour with a therapist or a clinician before they started to and these are 15 year old kids if you don't think 15 year old is a kid, then the conversation is over. That's a, a 15 year old is a kid. I do. They can't make <laughs> these choices. And so these people are also saying those things because they don't want you to know that they're getting 15 minute, 20 minute hour intakes and literally getting testosterone that same day. So that's just the start of the process. And then if they have the, they can go to a, uh, there is an actual person in Florida who's doing top surgeries on minors and sometimes doesn't even ask for the parental consent. So I don't really? know. What, yes, I don't know what these people. That's what they're hiding from you. And, and you say, you know, I know this because I talk to the transition to the, the transitioners, and they, you know, and I would kind of agree that you know there's there's lack of good comprehensive data. So you know, there's not like a source people can point. To. And I think this is especially true of the states because of the the messy you know healthcare system. And I I also suspect that the fact that in other countries people are doing more of a you know are able to to review what's going on with say transgender you know medicine and so forth like you know whatever Sweden or the UK uh, the the healthcare system I think works in a way that makes it easier to keep track of what what actually happening. And in the states it's kind of impossible to know because you have all these you know entities and uh so it's all very indirect and did you see what i mean so i'm not i'm not saying you're wrong i'm I just know. saying that you're from a, if you're an outsider and you're like you know okay right. let me you know i want to make my mind up on this what you hear essentially is you know uh, my word against your word you know that's right so hard. It's so hard. That's right. Because it's, I mean, I have on the one hand, I have a, a bunch yeah. of people telling me that it's really easy right. to get, and then I have on the other hand, I have people telling me it's extremely, extremely hard. And I try to look for data on this, and 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 actually, they everyone disagrees with each other in the psychology, in the literature. I would say for people listening who might not might not be convinced either way, might be trying to make up their mind on this. Think about the people who are speaking out. What is their inventive or incentive to speak out? What do they have to gain or lose? So you have the people who say that, oh, this is a very long, drawn out process. It's very cautious. No one's being rushed through. What do they have to lose by saying that? I mean, they're, they're coming from a place of probably wanting to protect access to care for trans people, which I, I think should be something that we, we are supportive of, appropriate care, not rushing people through. But then you see the detransitioners who get completely ripped apart for speaking up about their own personal experiences. What do they have to gain from speaking out about this? You know, you have to weigh the two and really ask yourself. I, I feel on one side, it's they're protecting a narrative and the other side, they're trying to speak truth to something that's really happening. Yeah. And it sounds like equally, you know, you can have multiple people trying to come from a good place. And it sounds like you all are coming from a good place, too. Um, and they're coming from or at least intentions, right? Like you're trying to protect children 
children and in their view they're trying to protect children too right i think most of the voices on 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 various sides um i don't think there's that many evil people maybe i'm being too optimistic here but i think people are seeing it a different way now buck maybe, maybe buck might disagree with that they're one. denying science though when they're in their in their form of so-called That's protecting right. children they're denying the scientific research on desistance they're denying the scientific right. research on um, rapid onset gender dysphoria. They're denying the studies yeah. on detransitioners, showing that these young people are detransitioning very soon after making the decision to live as a third gender or as male. So I, I, I yeah. agree with you. I think we should be having a conversation. I do think most people hopefully are coming from a good place. But when you are actively shutting down voices and silencing people, to me, that's not acceptable, especially when it is coming from a place of actually having numbers and data to support your argument. Yeah, look, I agree with that. I agree with that. And uh, and my friend uh, Jesse Single has uh, just beautifully, I think, talked about the nuance of this in a way, showing that there are really serious concerns here that should be taken seriously. That does pain me when I see activism shut down uh, the truth. So I'm, I'm uh, that I can take a, I can take a stand on that one. I only want people to have what I have. I would never not want somebody to transition who doesn't need it. What I want is a safety system. I went through a safety system, right? I went through a whole wriggle, a whole thing to get where I am today. Never looked back ever. Made the choice as an adult. Have made my life so amazing. Transition is amazing for people who actually need it. We don't have a safety system. We have a sloppy medical system that I really feel is sort of using the trans community in a way that uh, on some level experimentation on some level money and what what you said marco is it's so messy here we don't have any we're not even like documenting what's going on here on top of that why do i get shut down from the trans community when i just want to have a conversation all i want is for this to be safe that's all i want yet i get constantly shut down i get constantly called a transphobe a turf you know i'm i'm a bootlicker i mean how how dare people say that to me i've been in this community for a, a long liquor? yes it's it's sick what they what? yeah you know meaning that is, meaning that like i'm siding mean? i'm siding with the with oh. the wrong people if they really cared they would hear all sides to the story and they would hear everything because i care and it's not that i want to shut down medical i want medical to be tightened up i want us to understand what's going on here i don't want kids to be rushed through a system when you rush this isn't a rush this should never be a rush. This is something slow, methodical. Maybe even you can get the person out of it. You know, I don't want to be trans. I wish to God I was born a man, but I'm not and I have to fix it. That being said, why are we not helping these people get out of that disorder? Instead, we're like literally shoving them back in the disorder. I, th I thought mental health care was to help people sort of acclimate, do things, even possibly move them forward throughout to get them out of that situation. I don't see that. I see this desire to create this transgender space so big and so powerful. Again, not my area. So talking about, you know, the issues with treatment, this, I, I just got to listen to, you know, to Buck and maybe Deb, she has more, more ground in there. Let me, let me kind of go back to a theme that I, I kind of found it interesting and kind of let it go. This theme of identity. I would, I would be fascinated, you know, I would love to hear what people think about the, uh, the way identity is kind of used in relation to, you know, sex, gender, and so forth. Because it's, you know, it's, um, let, let me tell you why. So first thing, I think there's a mixing up of two, of two issues. And one is people uh, getting to, you know, use this kind of self-identification or this kind of identity, you know, self-construction self or self, uh, um, how do you say? Uh, self-certification, let's say, of identity, right, in an instrumental way. So the idea that you can, you know, whatever, do uh, you want to go to women's prison? And so you send an effort. So, but that's very kind of instrumental and obviously kind of insincere and so on. But the other, it, it blends into something that I find more interesting, which is how do people construct and develop their own identity with respect to sex and gender uh, in a in a space of discourse where if i'm right you know we are not we just you know we're not helping people think clearly about these things and things become incredibly confusing and incredibly kind of in a way uh let's say uh, ungrounded from from reality at least biological reality but that doesn't end up in my view in a place where everyone's just you know creative and and free to uh, determine their own very special personality it actually ends up in a place where people seem to to adopt this kind of very 
uh, rigid and, and kind of constraining views of, of gender. And so it's kind of, it's a bit paradoxical. And what I think is, is a, you know, when you're talking about, so I talk about sex and gender, right? This, this, this connection that was introduced, it was really introduced at some point between the biology, the body and sex from gender, which is kind of in the mind and in, in a sense in society, you know, come from, from society, sense reinforcement processes and so on. And then there's a third step, which is you're moving from this thing about gender, which is still measurable. Because you can, you can study sex differences and study, say, sex differences in personality or behavior in certain conditions. You can do, you know, run experiments on people and see, you know, how males and females react to different kinds of conditions. You can, you can measure, you see, cognitive abilities in men and women. So you can, you're still at an objective level. When you're moving to gender identity, it's not just a, an extension of, of the same thing. You've really crossed the boundary. Because do you see what I mean? So because you, you're you're in the real now, when in two ways, one is you're you're uh, really entering a place where it seems to be all about subjective, yeah. uh, the subjective perspective. You're kind of cut all ties to to even what's kind of measurable and objective and, and consensual. And on the other hand, you know, I don't know if I agree with that, but right. But we get. But that, that's what I, I I think it, it would be interesting to know how everyone is thinking about this. And then identity is so. Fascinating because it really is, you know, that's one place where I think everyone sh- agrees or should agree if, they're, <laughs> if they agree with me. Uh, social construction really is a thing, right? It's a, there's a big, really big chunk in the way we, we uh, develop our identities of construction. And I, you know, my ex- one example, you, you know, let's say you drink, you stop drinking and you have problems with drinking and then you, you stop drinking. What are you? Mm-hmm. Right? Are you a person who had a problem, you know, a drinking problem, and now you you recovered? Mm. Or you know, so if you go to AA, uh, that's not the way it works out. You actually mm. you're strongly encouraged to adopt an identity of I'm an alcoholic, mm. right? And I I will always be blah blah blah. So and that I'm not criticizing. It could be therapeutic in some mm. in some context, right? So I'm not disputing that it can have a function, but it's interesting because whether you end up being you know okay, I'm just this person who had a, a drinking problem versus I'm an alcoholic and that's my identity, you know, part of my identity really depends on the kind of social, you know, what's your social environment kind of, you know, directs your attention to, the way you explain certain things to yourself and the kind of explanations and interpretation that are offered to you. Uh, and I think, you know, porn, addi- porn addiction, uh, I, I'm, I'm friends with some people who do research on-, on Some people you know, argue that's not a thing, by the way. Wait, that's, like but David that's the, Lay. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, 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 I, yeah I'm thing. on the fence on that one. Yeah, yeah. Right. But one, one of the, let's say, one of the readings of the evidence is that porn addiction is not, not really about the behavior of people. So it's not like you really have a, a disordered behavior, particularly with respect to other people. It really has to do with the way people come to interpret what they're doing in terms of their identity. You see mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you, and, and Like shame. Person, like they feel shame for their activities. Whereas well, the ones it could be a bunch of, of different things, but there's right. there's a construction process at the end of which you're saying right. I'm a porn addict, right. or I'm an alcoholic. I'm I don't know I'm I'm uh, I'm a sinner, or maybe that I'm sounds a... like an identity I never want to adopt. I'm a porn addict. Like even if I am a porn addict, I don't want that to be my identity. <laughs> well, I don't want that I identity. Would... Yeah. Right. What I would Sorry, say to that, because yeah. I studied hypersexuality before and so-called oh. porn addiction, and I want to acknowledge that definitely excessive porn use exists, problematic porn use exists. There are some people who use porn to the point of it negatively affecting their day-to-day life, impairing their work, their relationships. That is real. But is it an addiction or is it a poor coping skill? And if you actually talk to these individuals, like I agree, I think there is an aspect for some people who use it as an an identity, because when you say that to to other people, they immediately understand what you're referring to, to some extent. And I think it also shifts the responsibility to say, this is a problem, as opposed to these are potentially bad choices I am making in terms of my day-to-day life. So I don't think we should shame people who struggle with pornography. I think definitely like good treatment, same thing with anything, good treatment is very important. And I think I think there should be less less shame around talking about it for people who do talk about their issues. I you know applaud them. I think that must take a lot of courage because obviously there is a lot of shame and stigma around talking about that. But mm-hmm. again, it's about going to the evidence and doing it in a way that is not political 
is not about appealing to particular activist groups or whomever. It's about really trying to figure out what is this about, regardless of whom it might anger. And I just, can I just go back to Buck's earlier point about prisons? As someone who's worked with sex offenders, many of the people who are advocating for self-ID policies, my, my, I imagine they have probably never sat down face to face with a sex offender. Because if you have, you know that this is a completely different type of person that you're dealing with. You cannot take anything that they say at face value. And especially not when, if, if they are convicted on a rape, you do not put them in a place where they potentially have access to more victims. So it's just beyond me that this is happening. And in terms of why we are talking about the definition of woman as opposed to what is a man, I always just say to people, look at who is advocating for this, and that will tell you why. There you go. So That's right. you're making some really good points about cases where there's queer potential violations. But do you all agree that it's perfectly fine for children, children and adults to change their pronoun if they want to do you see any problem with like more innocuous things it doesn't infringe on the rights of others but it's validating their own inner experience well that i i feel like there needs to be a little nuance attached to that because some of the stuff i'm sort of reading and hearing about is that if we don't sort of socially transition these kids they'll grow out of their dysphoric space right now that being said i was raised in that space of male mm. you know i was a tomboy my my parents called me you know buck i was you know that way and on some mm. level that would be considered social transitioning right so mm. yeah. I, I i'm not i can't say that i'm 100 percent sure again i'm i always go to the kids you know that's sort of my focus today and me being right. in these spaces and when adults want to do things i just you know what come on you can do what you want i, I really do feel right like who cares yeah, if a i don't care old decides they want to be a different pronoun i don't care what they do to be honest with you i'm sad if they make mistakes medically but i don't don't really care i really so i'm wondering if we do give this sort of space to children and i live in california and california is implementing many things in the school systems and you know in in the younger school systems that i disagree with and so i wonder if if letting a kid who's 10 or 11 sort of be a he or a she, is that social transitioning or is that just playing around with, you know, their gender space? And, you know, so I'm kind of stuck. I'll be honest. I am stuck on that with kids because, again, I just want kids to be free and do whatever they need to do. And hopefully they'll just grow up and be OK with themselves. But, you know, so to just like put these stamps of. Of, of male and female on, on them when they might feel or be born the other way. It feel, feels sort of we're pushing them into a space. But in, in, on a sense, I don't understand a 10-year-old taking on the non-binary. There are 10-year-olds taking on non-binary now. And I, I wonder to myself if that's dangerous. I start having problem with this kind of stuff when you're, what you're doing more or less consciously is introducing false explanations. Right, right. <laughs> This yeah. So it's mm -hmm. that what, what really bothers me when you say introducing, you know, let's say you can change your pronouns. Can you change, you know, yeah. it's not the thing itself that bothers me. Is when you're, by doing that, you're kind of introducing a whole way of thinking about what it means to be, say, male and female and so forth, that is, uh, is false. <laughs> That's where I, I start having. So to take the, the, the porn addiction, and again, I'm not taking a stand on, on, on the evidence because I'm not that familiar, but uh, I think it's just an interesting example. And of course, my intention was not to shame anyone with you know problems. We know, we know, we're not trying to shame people. So it's but that, that's the that's a perfect example because in that case, we feel we can and should have a debate about whether people who say I'm a porn addict actually are porn addicts or not. You know, you're right. Right. that's your identification with a certain thing. But we're we're debating: does it make sense to say that? Because it matters. Because if if we say, you know, because we could say, okay, well, what if some people want to say they're porn addicts? You know, you know good for them. But that, that you actually have a problem now because it implies, you know, if you if you validate that, it implies that pornography, say, works in a certain way. It can make you an addict just like drugs can. You know, th there are implications for our understanding of the world that may actually matter quite a bit. And so when you say I have no binary, right? Uh, when someone say I have no binary, do we feel, let's say, uh, do we feel we can have the same kind of conversation? It's like, okay, I understand, I get why kind of you're, you're saying that. Yes. But does it make sense to say that what you're interpreting as being non-binary actually is being non Do you see yes. what I mean? So I do. Asymmetry, though. But yes. the, you know, the other side, 
would say that you're privileging uh, physical characteristics over psychology as the truth. No. Uh, this is what they would say, you know, because uh, and that's what would probably makes their blood boil listening to what you just said is that you're saying that like one is real and the other thing isn't real. But I think that the point you made is a really good one, actually. And and I gave you an example that everyone can relate to. And you, you found it funny when I told you this. But I, I really think no one's given me a good challenge to this. And let's take the field of gifted education, okay? Mm. Imagine if all of a sudden giftedness was purely based on self-report, that there was no objective. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like suddenly, like any child can just show up to the school and be like, I'm a gifted student. Like I deserve special resources and everything. Like we'd be like, um, maybe like there is some something that can be scientifically needs to be measured here that you are going to actually benefit from those resources in some way. But I would almost not be surprised if if educators would be like, sure, if you identify as gifted, you are gifted. That's we're right. going to totally, maybe, maybe we're we're gonna totally support gifted you. Because education <laughs> programs – well, you're right because gift, we're seeing a trend Get towards gift, <laughs> <laughs> we're, gifted education programs are being cut because there's not a high representation of African-Americans in yeah. gifted education programs. So instead of believing in African-Americans that they're capable of excellence yeah. at all, they're just cutting the programs. Ridiculous. And I don't think that's the no. right message we need to be sending to African-Americans mm-hmm. right. uh, children is mm-hmm. – like anyway we need to believe in people um but so you see my analogy there and and i and no one's been able to really kind of um to, to you know challenge to challenge that in a way that i've been satisfied with because i don't think we do want to live in a world where everything is self-report all <laughs> all of a sudden and I, and I think that's a lot of what you all are 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 trying to say like hold up we don't want to move to that society and Deborah's in her yeah in her head sees the uh, apocalypse happening uh, where we do go we do yeah. like Deborah sees it sees yeah. the she's going to the nth degree in her head of where this is all heading you know <laughs> I know can I, I see can, can uh, I just yeah. speak to one point I think Buck and I this may be the only point in which we may have a different opinion in terms of the social transitioning of kids yeah. uh, mm-hmm. in that research has shown that for kids who socially transition they are more likely to go on to persisting in their gender dysphoria. So I agree with you, Buck. I think I don't think kids should be tied to gender stereotypes. I think let kids play with the toys they want, have the friends they want. And in an ideal situation when this issue was less political, less politicized, you could let a child live however they wanted and use whatever pronouns and whatever. Let the child eventually decide how they want to live. But nowadays, I would I mean, I hear from parents all the time, if you have a little boy, say, who's even slightly feminine, everybody wants to jump on that and say, oh, you must really be a girl. Are you a girl? Have you thought about being a girl and talk to the parents about it? It's and it's like these are children. You know, kids say all types of crazy things. They want to experiment and give them that freedom and space instead of wanting to make this something so concrete. And especially with the the so-called non-binary children, I think this is just creating more confusion for these kids because no, there's no such thing as non-binary. And children need their parents to say to them, you know what, if you have a boy who puts on a wig, he's not now a girl or he's not somewhere in between male and female. He's still a boy just wearing a wig. Otherwise, they don't have any understanding of gender and, and the fact that gender is permanent to, to, for the most part, right? Except for the, what is it, six in a thousand people who are transgender in adulthood. And then also with regards to pronouns, I think adults should be able to identify how they want. They, them, I, I, I'm not a fan yeah. of just because it's not scientific. <laughs> Um, you're not not a fan of they them. Uh, well, that's a valid. It's a valid gender identity, right? Um, right. I mean, even I mean, if it's you can not, identify you as yeah. that. I'll call someone. I'll call someone they them, but yeah. don't tell me that's what science says. And don't don't say that you're also the same as someone who's, who that your perspective. I would say should be taken as much weight as someone who has actually medically transitioned, because to me that's that comes across as disrespectful. Thank you, thank you for saying right. I'm not the same. I'm not the same as a non-binary yet. Now we're put under the, we're completely, I mean, you can just put us side to side, you know, beside each other. There, There is no way we are the same. We're not the same. Problem for me with just self-IDing as non-binary, for example, I'll give you another example. Uh, we had a horrible shooting at uh, called Club Q. And all of a sudden that shooter mm-hmm. Decided. I don't know. Maybe they were. Maybe they are non-binary. I don't know. They're non-binary. Because now we don't have any basis to sort of push against somebody who shot up a bunch of people and then all of a sudden said, "I'm a non-binary." They them and the community was like, "No, they're not. They're not non-binary. They look like a man." I mean, some of the stuff that was coming out of their mouths was so hypocritical and so contradictory. Envy phobia. 
<laughs> what what kind of phobia? Envy phobia, which is phobia of envies or non-binary people, which I'm joking. Oh, I never I never heard that one before. Okay. It was actual non-binary people. Actual non-binary people denying that this person takes that identity of non-binary saying that they only did it because of the shooting. Sure, it's hypocritical, but you're you're going back to the fact that there is there is there are two, more than one thing in play mm. here. So the the purely instrumental kind of manipulative adoption of, of yep. identities for some yep. purpose, and people who actually sincerely take on an identity because it explains something about themselves. That's exactly my point. And I, I'm not saying that someone doesn't feel non-binary, but the problem is now anyone can just be non-binary. And then does that put them into a space? You can't say anyone can identify as non-binary and then at the same time say, well, accept them. Of course, people don't think the way the way they always they oh, say they oh, think. Oh, I, I completely I, agree with that, I, Trampa. Yeah. So Scott, <laughs> can I call you Trampa? <laughs> Of course. I was I was not arguing that non-binary is not a thing. Yeah. That's the that's the crucial point I'm trying yes. to make. Uh, actually if there are people right. who say you know genuinely identify and say I I feel I'm non-binary. Yeah. I'm extremely curious to know why? you know what they why why they're thinking yeah. that, why they're fe- what they're feeling, yeah. what kind of phenomena they're referring oh. to. Can we maybe is it all I don't think it's all subjective. Mm-hmm. By the way, because when people tell you why, you know, they're so, for example, some of the and, and it's a constellation of categories, right? But some things within this non-binary, gender, queer, gender fluid, they, they do capture stuff that's real. So the fact, you know, people who they feel male or female, depending on the day or right, it changes. That kind of seems, you know, if you take it from one perspective, it's like, you know, yeah, whatever. But, you know, from a different perspective, it's true that, you know, personality does fluctuate a bit. People do feel differently. They have they have hormonal fluctuations we have you know different social contests kind of bring us different sides of our personalities in play at different times so the phenomena can be quite real and what my argument would be because we don't have a shared kind of a sophisticated vocabulary for talking about this kind of variation uh, people end up uh, you know converging on these labels that seem to you know say everything and nothing at the same time but i'm not saying that binary is not a thing uh but as for porn addiction, I, we're, going, also, we're going back to porn addiction. That is not saying it's not a yeah. thing. What she's saying yeah. is this: you know, there's some people who actually do have some, let's say, problematic or patterns of behavior that actually make yeah. them suffer for whatever reason. So it's not like it's not real. The question is: is addiction the the best framework to actually understand right. this thing? And I would make exactly the same point about non-binary. I'm not saying that people who identify as non-binary, you know, don't have reasons for for doing so. But I think we should be able to have a debate about whether non-binary from a scientific point of view is, you know, a good description of what's going on or or not. And also about whether it's actually helping people or hurting people in the sense that is it is it a byproduct of being only able to think about males and females in extremely rigid Mm. terms? Mm. So whenever you feel you're kind of outside the bounds of these rigid boxes, then you feel you you must be. You see what I mean? So, yes, uh, yes. yes. Right. So that would be my point. And again, as a as a you know biological psychologist, I would say uh, it's not all about biology, but I would think that biology does give you some tools to sometimes make sense of this. You know, interesting things that happen to people in relation to their sex and gender and so forth. That's why I keep saying non-binary is not trans. It's 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 not me. It's completely uh, uh, my my gender identity, whatever you want to call it, of being a male never fluctuates. I don't fluctuate. One day I feel like a woman, one day I don't I actually wanted to get rid of that. I literally shut well, that down. <laughs> well, I I I interviewed a non-binary trans person as part of this series. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I found their perspective valuable and interesting. And that's fine, but I'm not um, the same as them. Yeah. I'm not the same as them. And that's why their needs. Well, I find your experience valuable they too. Need, I'm so, saying it's not zero sum, right, buddy. We need, to, zero sum. we need to move away from they speak for me because the non-binary people are over speaking me constantly and saying. Tra- but you don't identify as non-binary trans. So you're not even in I'm that I'm not even anywhere world, near right? that. I'm so, not even anywhere. I'm binary right, right. male, walk the world as male. I don't walk the world as a trans person. Trans is my disorder that I have learned to live with. And I do not identify as trans. I identify as a man. I want to be a man. And I walk the world as a man. That is the complete opposite of what is happening on that other side. And I, that's what I want people 
to hear is that we cannot be, I cannot have these people representing me because I don't even agree with things that they're saying. And it, it, how can I be put under that same umbrella? Well, my friend, I hope you, you feel as though we represented your voice today. You did. Yeah. yeah I just want to make a quick point. I, yes. I would argue that everybody to some extent is non-binary in that, yes, we all have <gasps> these fluctuations. Don't we all have, <laughs> but, but that is not, <laughs> that's uh, not a I'm reason a to then okay. say, <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> but why do we have to turn upside down this idea that gender and that's sex right. are binary? That's right. To acknowledge that there can be difference, there can be variation. I, I feel it's just people who want to be special. Yeah, <laughs> so true. You know, Doc, Doc, I, I'm going to call you Deborah right now. Deborah, you, <laughs> okay. I, I, I adore you, Deborah, but you, you can be savage. <laughs> That's why, that's why I love you. Let's be honest. I say what people And I know are that's thinking. why Buck lo- I know a lot of people love you because of that. I mean, you can be <laughs> you remind me of like a character from one of those Quentin Tarantino films where you just like <laughs> come in and like the Asian, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing. Look, I, I and I say that with love. I absolutely adore you. I want to hang out with you more. No, I love you, you know, too. I want to yeah. I really want to hang out with you more. You're you're super fun. Um but I get a little bit of a facts don't care about your feelings vibe from you sometimes. And I guess I like me you know, I'm not there yet because I feel like on the one hand, I'm I'm going to do two hands here. On the one hand, I do think that feelings are a particular truth. Uh, it's not generalizable truth. We can all agree on that. But it is that person's truth. And there is something there's there's value in the field of psychology for studying that through qualitative methods and then various things. There's value to that. Um, but you know, we do we do need to as you make this point, that's not generalizable truth. Uh you care a lot about science. I know you do, and you care a lot about generalizable truths and you care a lot about and, and it drives you bonkers, as it drives me bonkers too, when someone makes a statement that is clearly untrue from a generalizable point of view and they make a, a truth claim. That drives me bonkers too. My head explodes too, so I'm with you on that. But I am kind of like one hand, two hand about it in that way, if that makes sense. No, that makes sense. And I do think it's important to be compassionate. And I don't think being a truth teller necessarily means that you're not compassionate or not empathic. And in some cases, I think almost the way society is going, that we value so much feelings and emotions and people's experiences is detrimental in some cases to them if those experiences are not warrant some some amount of pushing back or challenging in a gentle way. Because if it isn't, so say for someone who says they want to identify as whatever they want to identify as, if it's about something else like sexual trauma or sexism or, say, not being comfortable with their sexuality or because they are on the autism spectrum, shouldn't those be the topics of discussion and seeking to have greater compassion and an understanding for what they're actually going through as opposed to this Band-Aid solution, which is that, oh, you are this so-called persecuted gender minority that doesn't exist and so especially when I see the way that oh, I'm going to get you in so much trouble. But I think the way that we're going we and that <laughs> you, we, we, we can't do objective studies anymore about That's this right. in academia. You just can't. I think you have to be savage in response to that well, because however, they're not, otherwise not going to right. listen to you. Well, I don't know if we have to, you know, you, you, you take the rip the bandaid off approach. Like you will tweet, look, sex is binary. <laughs> it is, it is un- and change, unchangeable. But, you know, whereas I would like maybe make that point. Secondly, first, I would say all, you know, subjective experiences, <laughs> but, dude, but that's all, that's all I'm saying. Pull a lotion on before you shove it in. Okay. <laughs> Well, it works with different. Although I, it works with different people. I mean, oh, I'm yeah. saying, yeah. Some yeah. people actually, in defense of the blunt approach. Yeah. Okay. And I, okay. Okay. You know, free speech. People, That's why we have free speech, and I'm a, I'm a proponent of free speech. Yeah. Some people actually, you know, benefit from being kind of, you know, woken up from from their from their <laughs> slumber. Well, clearly, Doctor So is doing something right. She has a huge following, right? You have a lot of people that stand by you, and uh, Trampa over here is nodding his head every her. time you you speak. I love her. I, I, I do. I love I her. You too. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, I want to be respectful of all your time today. This might be a good time to kind of end um, and just thank you all. So, unless there anyone did any of you want to, you like dying to say or make a point uh, here today? No, no we can I appreciate end. the okay, conversation. Thank you, so, thank you so much for bringing Thank you me so on. much to all of you. Thank you so much. This was super fun. And uh, and if people disagree with uh, things we said, like write comments. You know, that's what the free speech is about, right. right? Like we value your comments and we value your perspective yes. as well. Um, it's uh, it's just that's just 
how this we live. That's called society. So anyway, thanks everyone and have a have a good one. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.